Today we bow our heads to commemorate a time of terror and death in a city that throbs with life and hope. We are in the right place. There is a savage irony to the fact that the horror in Mumbai began with terrorists docking near the gateway of India. This magnificent arch behind me, built in 1911 to welcome the British King, has ever since stood as a symbol of the openness of this city. Crowds flock around it, made up of foreign tourists and local yokels. Touts hawk their wares, boats bob in the water, offering cruises out to the open sea. The teeming throngs around it daily reflect India's diversity, with Parsi gentlemen out for their evening constitutionals, Muslim women in burqas taking the sea air, Goan Catholic waiters enjoying a break from their duties at the stately Taj Hotel, Hindus from every corner of the country chatting in a multitude of tongues. Four years ago tomorrow, ringed by police barricades, the gateway of India, the gateway not just of India, but to India and to India's soul, was barred. Mute testimony to that criminal assault on this country's pluralist democracy. The terrorists who right here heave their bags laden with weapons up the steps of the wharf to begin their assault on the Taj, like their cohorts at a dozen other locations around the city, knew exactly what they were doing. Theirs was an attack on India's financial nerve center and commercial capital, a city emblematic of the country's energetic thrust into the 21st century. They struck at symbols of the prosperity that was making the Indian model so attractive to the globalizing world. Luxury hotels, a swish cafe, an apartment house favored by foreigners. The terrorists also sought to polarize Indian society by claiming to be acting to redress the grievances, real and imagined, of Mumbai's and India's Muslims. And by singling out Britons, Americans, and Israelis for special attention, they demonstrated that their, ban their brand of Islamist fanaticism is anchored less in the absolutism of pure faith than in the geopolitics of hatred. The terrorists hit multiple targets in Mumbai, both literally and figuratively. They caused death and destruction to Indians with near impunity, searing India's psyche, showing up the limitations of our security apparatus and humiliating the authorities. They dented the worldwide image of India as an emerging economic giant, a success story of the era of globalization and an increasing magnet for investors and tourists. But the tragedy also grave, gave birth to great heroism. I pay tribute to the policemen and security forces who fought back, in many cases at the cost of their lives. I pay tribute to the ordinary citizens who came to the rescue of the wounded. I know there are some here today amongst us. I honor the spirit of a city that came together to heal its wounds, to help the victims and to raise its collective head in defiance, saying to the killers, you shall not prevail. Tomorrow as happened four years ago, the platitudes will flow like blood. Terrorism is unacceptable, the terrorists are cowards, the world stands united in unreserved condemnation of this atrocity, and so on. Commentators in America trip over themselves to pronounce this night and day of carnage, India's 9-11. But India has endured many attempted 9-11s, notably a ferocious assault on a national parliament in December 2001 that nearly led to all-out war. The year of 2611 alone, 2008, was one in which terrorist bombs had already taken lives in Jaipur, in Ahmedabad, in Delhi, and in an eerie dress rehearsal for the effectiveness of synchronicity in several different places on one searing day in the state of Assam. Mumbai combined all the four elements of its precursors. By attacking it, the terrorists tried to hit India's economy, its tourism, and its internationalism 
and they took advantage of this gateway of the city's openness to the world. That was what they tried to do. They failed. The Islamist extremism nurtured by a succession of military rulers of Pakistan has now come to haunt its well-intentioned civilian government. The bombing of Islamabad's Marriott Hotel and various military sites have proved that Frankenstein's monster is now well and truly out of that government's control. The militancy once sponsored by its military now threatens to abort Pakistan's sputtering democracy and has sought to engulf India in its flames. There has never been a stronger case for firm and united action by the governments of both India and Pakistan to cauterize this cancer in their midst. Today we live in hope that the latest peace initiative between India and Pakistan will take wings and end the narrative of death and despair that has bedeviled our relationship. Four years ago it became clear that India had become the theater of action of a global battle, one which threatens Indian lives, it is true, but one whose worldwide objectives also mean that we are not alone in this fight, as we can see with the presence of so many international diplomats here today. Indeed, Pakistan should be on the same side as us in what for them is an existential struggle. That is also part of the solidarity we are all expressing today. Mumbai and India have recovered from the physical assault against us. Ours is a land of great resilience that has learned over arduous millennia to cope with tragedy. Bombs and bullets alone cannot destroy India because Indians will pick their way through the rubble and carry on as they have done throughout history.